we're in business. So, uh, hi, I'm Fred. In case you haven't met me before, uh, certified crop advisor for Farmers Exchange. Um, real quick, before I get going on hay preservation here, we, we were kind of talking about a few things earlier, uh, hay quality, hay storage, um, but one, one thing that kind of we decided we want to talk about a little bit more is focus on kind of preserving that quality because number one, we live in Northeast Ohio, you know, the Sunshine State, right? Uh, so it's hard to make good quality hay. Um, so the, the quality that we do have, uh, we want to preserve. We want to keep it as long as we can through the winter and, and, and everything like that. So just uh, bear with me. Um, I try to keep things somewhat interactive. So uh, if, you, if you don't mind, just show, show of hands how many people make, uh, make hay themselves. Okay. I'd say that's probably what 80 percent. Okay, 80 percent make hay. Okay, all right. Of those people who raise their hand, how many of you have a feed sample for your hay? One, two. All right. Let's just say five percent. All right. Now this is the really, really tricky question. How many know what their cost is per bale? Cost of production per bale. Nothing? Nobody? I do. You do? All right, we'll, we'll say 1%. Thanks. So that's a big no-no in my book. Uh, I, a little background on me before I get going here. Uh, I went to school at Ohio State University for agricultural economics. That's why I like numbers. Um, be, yeah, it's okay. You will later, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but one thing that I really try to focus in on my job and on, on, on my operation as well, we have about 160 acres at home, some row crops that we share a crop a little bit with, um, some cattle, we also background about 100 head a year for this year signed up um, and we do every 90 to 120 days so we're on top of that I uh, I am full-time employee at Farmers Exchange so I have a lot of free time on my hands that's when I look at numbers um, so as I go through this uh, just bear with me I am very numbers focused because at the end of the day us growers need to be profitable if we're gonna be sustainable sustainable is great you know, we, we're, we're getting really good at that part. What we're not really good about is knowing our cost of production and making a, a profit because nobody's paying us to lose money. I mean, maybe. If they are, I'm not aware of it. So shame on me. Uh, so let's see, just click it. Or, there it is. Yeah. yeah. Just click it. Acid, man. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. So, uh, propionic acid. That is probably one of the biggest active ingredients for uh, preservation um, items. So, what we do at home is we uh, we we started around 160 acres was all hay. Now we're down to about 40 or so. Um, but what we do is we put we will spray this acid on uh, while we're baling, and that will help preserve the quality of, of, that, uh, of, that, of that hay. Um, it helps with mold prevention, um, which if you know 17 to 20% moisture, is, you're gonna start getting some mold there, and that's, that's when you see that white kind of dusty when you go to bust that bale open, kind of get that musty smell. Um, that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, and also heat reduction. So, we need to let that bale sweat at least a day or so, two days in the field, or you know somewhere before you go put it away, because that could be a bad, that could be a bad day if we just bale it, put it in the in the barn, and next thing you know we're like, oh crap, where's the water at? Because um, it's on fire. Anyhow, uh, and it also adds baling time. So one of the biggest benefits for me having a full time job is, and, and living in Northeast Ohio, is. I get about two extra hours out of bailing. I can start an hour earlier and I can go an hour later. 
that dew will start to set in. I will watch that moisture go from 14, 15, 16, 17, yellow flag 18, red flag 19, red flag, you better stop right now, 20. So I can bale 17, 18% moisture, which is easy around here, uh, and I can still get away with it. Now, what's the cost of that? That's the big question, right? <coughs> Okay, so real quick, just back up. Promote Hay Shield, that's one, uh, that's one of the products we have at Farmers Exchange. I'm not biased, I do have another one, I will show you. Um, typically around $750 for a 450 pound uh, barrel, it's about 55 gallons. Uh, apply that about one to two pounds per bale, which is usually about two to four pounds per ton. That's assuming a thousand pound bale. Uh, so your cost per bale, is around uh, anywhere from $1.64 to $3.34. Uh, now that's just the acid. Now, John Deere at Keister's or wherever you go, they do have a product as well. It's a little cheaper. Notice it's still 450 pounds, but it's only 50 gallon. So it means it's a little bit heavier. Um, they do have a little bit of citric acid in there as well, which I don't know if that changes anything as far as uh, I think they might throw that in there just to keep from corrosion um, which I'll get into in a little bit but same thing two eight two dollars and eighty cents to five that's not right yeah the 560 bale their application rate is a little bit more it's it's two pounds to four pounds per bale or four to eight per ton <coughs> um, the system in general uh, it, it they vary the basic one, which is what I have, it's a, uh, it's a manual system. So you have a tank, you have a little sprayer, it's got two nozzles on it, sprays right over the pickup as the hay is coming in the baler. And uh, you can adjust the rate manually with a little switch inside the cab, uh, if you're lucky to have one. And that's around 2000 now, um, give or take. They have, uh, they, they have some systems up there that are around four to five thousand, probably more, and they'll automatically read the uh, the moisture and adjust as you're going. I just like to do it on my own, just because if it's if it's dry hay, I'm not going to put more money onto that dry hay unless I need to. So if it's 12% hay and I'm seeing that, and then I get on the outside row and it's 16, 17, I kick that thing on because I want to make sure that that wetter hay is still going to be, it's not going to mold and it's not going to transfer too much into the dry hay. So 2000, I depreciated it five years uh, with a $500 residual value. How many people do that? How many people kind of depreciate things for two, three, four years? Just show hands. A couple? All right, I'll give it 10%. 10%. Is this a large round barrel? These are large round bales, about a thousand pounds. I'm, I'm using a thousand pounds for easy math. Um, mine at home average around 900. Um, okay. So altogether, you're going to be looking at another four dollars and seventy-six cents per bale. Okay. So what does that mean? All right. Well. If I get two extra hours and I'm paying myself, I'll be I'll be cheap and I'm only gonna pay myself ten dollars an hour. There's twenty bucks a day, and that's not gonna add up to much per uh, per bale. But usually, what I figure is I, I can get about another ten acres in a day. So going back to us being in Northeast Ohio, uh, you know, not having a when we have a break, we want to take advantage of that break. So we, we're watching the weather and we see that it's time to go and we can go out and cut 20, 30 acres and get it done uh, and not have to worry about, oh, well, I'm only going to do this much because I'm not sure if I can get it done or anything like that. So again, knowing what your numbers are, knowing, knowing your business is, is going to be key here because I sell most of my hay, um, you know, and as my herd grows and as my needs grow, it'll kind of do one of these because I can, I can, it's hard to find the market, um, but if you're doing this system, you need to have a market for it. You need to make sure that you're you're not just taking it up to the sale barn and, oh man, I hope I get 25 bucks at least. 
because that's your break even. I mean, you got to know what your numbers are. Know your costs. So um, this is just kind of what I use for for my little hay enterprise at home, um, and I'm sure they'll vary. Uh, my fertilizer will probably be decreasing a little bit because I have more manure as I do more backgrounding, so that's a plus. Yeah, fertilizer salesman saying I'm going to decrease fertilizer because tough crowd. All right. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, I know that I have about twenty-seven dollars and nine cents tied up in every single bale that I make. How many people are getting over twenty-five bucks a bale at the uh, sale consistently? Every single week. <coughs> Show of hands. Okay. That's got insurance in there because I have to carry insurance because I'm a young guy and I break stuff. Um, it's got the acid in there. It's got my other equipment. You know, I rent my rake and stuff like that from my father-in-law, so I got to pay for that. Um, taxes. You know, I don't. If I'm going to be on somebody's ground, I need to pay them rent, and that rent needs to be able to cover their taxes. So I, I've got those all figured out for bail. Um, what this does for me is is it it lets me know, okay, if you know you're analyzing the situation whether you're going to bail more hay or you're going to sell hay. If I go and sell hay, I'm not going to go take it to the sale barn. Not because I don't like sale barn, because I don't know what I'm going to get for that that product. Okay, I, I know my numbers. I know my business well enough to where I can say, hey. Mr. Customer, I've got a feed sample for all of my hay, and I can tell you exactly which lot it is. That's going to be another 20 bucks, for, and that'll cover, you know, a pretty good chunk of bales. Um, that's the only other thing I probably don't have. You can probably add two bucks for that. So now I can say, all right, I know what my quality is. I use my preservative to make sure that it's going to be it's going to be a good product whenever you go to use it. And I know that I'm not doing this for free, and I need to be able to make at least, at least a little bit of money. So I'm gonna, you know, let's just say I'm gonna throw 20, 30 percent out there, 50 bucks, 40 bucks a bale, whatever, whatever that number is. You know, you got to know your costs if you're gonna, if you're gonna be selling hay. And that's probably the number one thing that I see on a daily basis working with growers that also do row crops. They got the row crop side down. They know how much it costs to plant that that acre of corn. They know how much it costs to plant that acre of beans or wheat, what have you. When it comes to hay, we're like, oh, probably around 10 bucks, maybe. You know, that, I think you might be surprised once you start digging into these. But uh, end of the day, you know, we make hay. Let's just say you're keeping this for yourself. So how many people just do hay and they keep it all for themselves? All right, so probably, what, 5% again? 15%? All right. 50? All right, 50. 50% 50 keep it. All right. So as far as feeding your cows, uh, and, and again, I'm not a nutritionist by any means, so, um, but, I, but I do like to manage you know, my feed quality as well. When you're, when you're feeding hay, do you want to feed junk hay or do you want to feed quality hay? And believe it or not, I get people that tell me they want to feed junk hay because they're beef cows and you don't need to feed them good hay. And I will disagree with that every single day. Because here we are trying to do more with less, and we're not going to do that if we got junk hay. Sorry, it's just not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen when we have 20, 30% of that bale is on the ground getting somped on. Yeah, it's building organic matter, that's great. But at the end of the day, I want it in that cow so that cow can make it into organic matter. Makes sense, right? So now you can take this number, put it into your cattle enterprise, and say, all right, well, I know how much my hay is. And if you look at like Ohio State website, they have uh, they have a lot of good tools there. Uh, NRCS has some good ones, the Grays and some of these other programs. But uh, Ohio State, they have one. It's a spreadsheet. They have it for each enterprise. So backgrounding cattle, finishing cattle as a market steer. Uh, direct, you know, the whole nine yards. And what they typically put in there, if you look, one thing that I noticed is they'll put about 150 to $200 a ton for hay. That doesn't sound large. And that's, that's, that's 100 bucks a bale. 
the hundred dollars back. So, you know, if you're looking at those numbers, it they're skewed. So you got to know what your cost of production is. So that's kind of I, I mean I could sit up here and go in more in, in the detail if you'd like on the on the hay uh, preservation, which I think it's a it's a good thing to do because even if you're keeping it for yourself. Uh, like I store hay outside, so how many people have a, a barn that they can put their hay in? Okay, pretty good. What, twenty percent? Is that good? So twenty percent barn. So that throws another cost in there. So you start adding all these costs up, and you're like, all right, well, you know, what's what's the point? So I'm, I'm let's just say I have thirty five bucks a bale. Now, that $35, if, if, if I'm going to spend money on something, I want it to get the best bang for my buck, right? So if I'm going to spend $35 to make a bale of hay, it's going to be pretty darn good hay. I'm going to keep it in a barn, and it's going to be just like brand new whenever I go take it out of that barn. Because as soon as I'm done, and the barn goes after it sweats, and you're feeding good quality hay, you're, you're, you're using all of it. You're not wasting anything. I mean, you're still going to have a little bit just because of feeding it outside or however you're feeding it but um, does this does this kind of make sense or I mean how many people have, how many people use preservative already one one two three of us younger guys too <laughs> shocker <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, uh, we, we like to try new things young guys so and we're always getting yelled at because we like to spend money and break stuff so uh, at least that's what my father-in-law tells me anyway so <laughs> But he likes it whenever I hand him the check at the end of the year. So, are there any questions? So how do you determine the commercial? You said 17 percent is kind of a break point. How do you determine? Yeah. That? So these systems actually, I let, let me talk about the system a little bit. So that's a good question. The question was, how do you figure out if it's 17 percent or what the moisture is? Well, these systems come with a with a sensor, and they go on each side of the baler. So as that feed's coming through and it's hitting the side it's going to tell you live in the, in the tractor what that moisture is. So if I'm in the middle, usually what I'll see is if I'm bailing along and I start, I usually start in the middle. I don't know if that's right or wrong. That's what my father-in-law told me to do. So I start in the middle because it's usually drier. So I'll start in the middle, go along, and it's, you know, let's just say 12%. And now it's like, all right, well, it's getting dry. It's getting late. Let me see what the outside is. So I go to the outside, it might be 15, 16, 17% kick that moisture on and you can adjust it, there's a little knob, um, and, and you can adjust how much acid you're putting down. So there's automatic systems that'll do that all for you, and that's great, <laughs> but they're a lot of money. Uh, they're, you're, they're, you're looking at four to five grand, which is fine. If, you, if you're covering an area, if you're covering a good chunk of ground and you got a lot of hay you're doing, it, those are great, because then it's just kind of a plug and play and you go along. Uh, my father-in-law always jokes around because Whenever I get in the baler, and, you know, he's like, you're always looking forward, man. I, I don't get it. You know, I'm always doing this and trying to flip all these switches. It's, it's just a nerve. It's a nerve-wrecking experience. But uh, there is a lot going on. Um, but it, it, it's a good way to, to keep, keep the quality that you have because you work hard for that. Why, why should we bust our butt off and then have a moldy bale and give it to our cows and be like, hm, sorry, here you go. <laughs> you know, I, I, if I was a cow, I wouldn't like that. So... Which is weird, but um, but the system just to give you a quick my artistic skills here. This is uh, four years of Ohio State, <coughs> Kevin, for you. So that's my baler, and no, it's not a case. So here's what you have on the system. Everybody see that? Looks pretty good, huh? I'm in the wrong career. Uh, so this is my tank. You know, I'll fill that up with acid, and then I've got a spray uh, spray line that comes here, and there's a there's a little bar that sits right above your your input. Um, so while that that baler is feeding hay, it's spraying a nice even coat right over top of that hay. So as it goes in, you know, it keeps it down. Now, for those of you who are like, all right, well. Um, you know, is it safe for my cows? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a, it's actually it's an organic compound. It's propionic acid. Uh, if you go online 
and, and take a look at the chemistry side of it, it is an organic material. Um, I think, if I remember right, I could be wrong, um, it, is a, it is a certified organic uh, product too. So for those organic people in the room, that's uh, still another option. It also kind of helps make that hay a little bit more palatable. Um, one thing I've noticed is whenever I go set a hay bale out, and again, I store mine outside, so no, no. But, um, uh, but whenever I go to feed a bale, if I have one that didn't have a whole lot of acid on it, even if they were dry, um, I've noticed they'll go to the one that did, that did have, have acid on it. And we've, I've heard that from multiple people um, people I sell it to, people that other people I know, they've run acid, uh, have have said the same thing. They've they've taken old bales out that didn't have acid, and they've took the same bale with acid, and the cows are going right to the one with acid because it's already somewhat broken down. So how am I doing on time? Good. Anybody sleeping yet? No. Good. Any other questions? That was a good question. Thanks. Nothing. Yeah, um, so we typically will come out, and, well not always, but we'll, we'll typically come out and, and pull a sample um, if you're doing a ration with us. Um, you'd have to talk to somebody at the mill that is actually knows what they're doing in feed, not this guy. Um, but yeah, you can, you can take a drill and, and probe through a core. Um, that's probably the, the main way. Here's how I do it. I wait till after that bale sweats. I get them all in my lots. And then I go ahead and pull my probes off of each lot. So I take that in the bag and I send it out to lab. The lab tells me what it is. Um, the, another way to do it on the stuff that I keep, that I'm keeping for myself, before I go feed it in the fall, I pull a probe. Because it's been sitting there for so long, it's changed. You know, it's gathered moisture because I, I can't store it inside. I don't have a barn. Uh, so that's something that you, you definitely, it's easy to do. I mean, you can get them for a drill. Um, and they're, they're actually not too bad. Uh, you just say if I can do it, everybody else can do it. So, um, but it, it's a good, good, it's not too bad. So that's usually the standard though. I don't know, maybe some people probably pull it out of a bunk if they're doing, doing like haylage or something like that in a bunk. But uh, most of the time just plug it. Now if you're doing like in a pasture setting, you know, then you're going out and you're cutting and putting it in the bag and cutting what the cows can eat and put it in the bag. How many people do that? You should see the look on my father-in-law's face when I go out to my pasture and I go take some hay and I cut it off and I put it in a bag. He's like, what are you doing, getting dinner? I thought my wife or my daughter fed you better than that. So, fun crowd. <laughs> I, I like to keep it kind of loose, so please, uh, questions, I, I really like. Question? Uh, there are a number of guys, and maybe I just want to figure it out. They know what it costs to bail a bale. Uh, have you figured out how much you have to get per pound for that beef you're selling to equal the amount of hay that that other fellow is using? Yeah, I mean, you can you can do it that way. I keep it in my average cost of production for feed is $1.50 a pound. I'm on a direct, a direct program, not a commercial feed. Okay, it's completely different. So when I'm looking at it, I'm looking at, I've got a little bit of grain, I've got my hay, and I've got some supplement in there, um, and I, I also have a little bit of processing that is in there too. So I'm paying the processing, which is seven cents of it. That's a good chunk. Um, again, there is a spreadsheet at uh, Ohio State. I'll just put that on there. Um, Ohio State, the economics department has a really good spreadsheet that goes through this. Um, but yeah, I do keep an eye on it, and then I adjust for it on my on my freezer beef. That's for your fat cattle. For my fat cattle. For my cows, I keep it on, you know, cost of calf, which you can do it either way, really. Um, you know, if you're feeding if you're feeding pears in in the in you know over the winter time, you can track. There, you can also track efficiency. I'm not smart enough to do it, but you can you can do the uh, efficient. You can track the efficiency of each cow, um, but it's a lot of work. Like you got to feed them hay. You got to weigh hay, feed them hay, then you got to weigh what they don't eat, and you can figure out how how efficient each cow is that way. Um, you can do it if you're if you've got them in a barn for a week, put them in, um, you know, throw a little bit of feed out there or some some hay, 
weigh, weigh it first and then come back in and weigh it, and you can do it that way. Um, but yeah, I, I do keep track of how much it costs per pound of beef. Um, I'm really small. I've only got 10 cows. So you know, I started two years ago, so it's it, the number's going to be pretty high for me. Um, but it, at the same time, it, it is a good thing to know. So good, great question. I miss it when you were saying, uh, how do you use these bales and leave it outside? Are they drying net or plastic wrap? Uh, they're net wrap. Okay. They're net wrap. Uh, we did use string. Um, it's a pain in the butt. So it's net wrap, I guess, realistically. Um, but when we were doing string, we just, we wrapped the living snot out of it. I mean, we just cut, it almost looked like a plastic wrap bale because we put so much string on it. Um, so that was cheaper for us to use net wrap, and we've you're gonna get a little bit of spoils having it outside. Period. I mean, it's just you can't do that. There's things we do to minimize that. Um, you know, we try and keep it on a slope. One thing I'm finally gonna do this year is get some gravel in because it's an area that we don't use. Is I'm gonna gravel it and then keep everything nice and tight so that water's coming off and it's not soaking in the in the bottom of the bale. That helps a lot. Um, but but yeah. Any other questions? Did I answer your question? Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Awesome. Well, if you... Oh, yeah. So, Ohio State... Um, it doesn't like me. Um, so, OSU... I see. OSU... A-E-D-E... You. Easiest thing to do is just go to Google and search uh, Ohio State Farm. I can't spell. It's my Ohio State education coming through there, Kevin. Budgets. So, and that'll uh, that'll go through there. Um, it's the Agricultural, Environmental, and uh, Developmental Economics uh, Division of Ohio State. And they've got corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, like a thousand different ones for, for steers. If you're doing a yearling steer, if you're doing calves, if you're doing distiller's grain, if you're doing, there's a pile of them. Um, they're really good. Keep in mind, go through those numbers and look, and they're, they're mostly showing really high numbers for feed. I mean, if you figure it costs me, let's just say 30 bucks, and it's a thousand pound bale, that's $60 a ton. So, you know, not, not a whole lot of people sell per ton, but, you know, you can kind of figure it out that way uh, where you're at. So, good question. Anything else? Any more jokes? I appreciate you guys. Thank you very much for uh, coming out and and this group of people that you're you're dealing with with uh, the grazing council is really great. They uh, they have a lot of good things that they're working on and they're really their heart is in the right spot. So anything any of us can do, um, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to look into something for you um, and try and help you out because that's my job at the end of the day. So thank you guys very much. Well, I appreciate Fred going through that. Uh, I wanted you folks to hear a little bit about that uh, preservative that he uses. I do buy hay from Fred, not that you have to buy. It's not an advertisement for Fred and his hay business, but I will attest to you that we put bales side by side, and the animals would go right to those bales every time. Uh, just a little funny story, you know, I've been talking to you folks a, a lot about whether it's more economical just to buy your hay or make your hay. And I was at church with a guy who just insists on making hay. And he, Ken and I got into this big argument, not really an argument, just a discussion about how, it, you know, with his 10 cows, he just absolutely, he wouldn't be a farmer if he didn't make hay. And I suppose we got a few of those in the crowd. Uh, and so we were going, uh, I was having a conversation with him and, uh, that was one Sunday, and the next Sunday, Fred had already made his hay, and I was going to buy that hay. And then we had got into the rainy season, and I told my wife as we were walking into church, I wonder how Ken's hay-making season's going. She said, don't say a word. Don't say a word. I said, 
can't do it, <laughs> can't do it. So I sat down, sat down, of course, I, he sat down right beside me in Sunday school. I said, I, look, I looked at Sarah, and she kind of scowling at me. <laughs> I looked over at Ken, I said, how's your hand making season going this year? <laughs> oh, he, he lays into me about the rain and all the nasty weather. I said, well, all the hay that I just bought is going to be delivered this afternoon. I'll have it in the barn, and I ought to have it in the barn by 4 o'clock. <laughs> he just said, he had talked to me since about that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it is important that we that we do a good job, you know, and we know what we're doing. Part of what we're trying to do is get you to, to do a better job of feeding your livestock, you know, whether we're talking about grazing, talking about feeding hay. And we just want to expose you to a lot of different things here. And, and uh, you know, we just want to talk about, you know, I, I, I've seen firsthand the value of that particular preservative, and I've seen what it's done for our animals, and I've seen what it's like to buy hay from, uh, from other producers that don't, and that you can't tell the quality of the hay by looking at it. I'm here to tell you, put it in front of the animal, see which one they eat, see what it looks like coming out of the back end of them. You know, you might be able to keep them alive on some of this stuff we're making, and that was part of the problem that I was getting into. I couldn't make the quality hay that I could buy. So if anybody's looking for hay equipment, talk to me afterwards, because it's all going to get sold here. <sighs> I'm serious. I'm, you know, if we're making 100 bales or less, 100 round bales or less, I don't think we can justify it. And for the last two years that I've been doing the taxes, I'm seeing the return on it. it this, this hay making equipment is nickel and diamond us to death. It's nickel and diamond us to death. And if you got the courage enough to give up the hay making, you'll see it. I promise you, you will see it in your bottom line. So enough of that. Uh, we want to get on to, Caitlin gives me all kinds of grief about running through too many numbers, right? So we're going to tag team on some uh, ways to get started with going from continuous to rotational grazing. Uh, because she says I use too many numbers, we're going to work through some things here with you and try to, you know, I, I, how many of you out here currently are actively rotational grazing? Most all of you. How many of you are thinking about it? Okay, so we got some of you in the crowd. So what we want to do, we, we do talk a lot of numbers, and I want to try, you know, our goal, Caitlin and I's goal is to simplify this process. But before we before we get started, wanted to ask the crowd, what are the excuses that we hear for not rotational grazing? Huh? It takes too much time. All right? What other kind of excuses do we hear? Worse than water. Huh? Where is the water? Where's the water? Okay, can't do it because of water. Okay, what what are some of the other excuses? Too much fence. What's that? Too much fence. Too much fence. Takes too much fence. Okay, what else? Gotta make hay. Gotta make hay. Oh, love to make hay. All right. All right. Anything else? What am I leaving out? My cows won't respect fence. Buffalo will, but cows won't. <laughs> anything else? We leave anything out? Nah, what's that? Why bother? There you go. Too much work. Too much work. Why bother? Absolutely. It's not worth it. My cows rotate themselves. Your, your cows rotate themselves. Okay, if you got enough acres, they'll do that. I have, I have heard it. I've heard it, and I've seen a few cases where they actually do, and it'll work. But you better have a bunch of land. Most of us are not independently wealthy and have thousands and thousands of acres to run ten cows on. Okay. Anything else? We got to be leaving something out. Okay. All right. Well, let's get started. What we, what we want to do here is just take a. Uh, that your, yeah, I don't okay. Know. Is that to work? Mm -hmm. What's that, Clint? Then you have to come back to the barn. Oh, I got to come back to the barn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is not working. <coughs> okay. That's okay. It should be working. Are you? Apparently, that's not oh, working. Oh, you know why either. it's not working? Yeah, you got the cable. We want to walk you through. Technical difficulties. Okay. 
So when we started having our grazing council meetings at the beginning of the year and kind of discussing some topics that we wanted to talk about this year, we talked about getting back to the basics. So that's kind of how we started talking about these kinds of things. Uh, usually we go to farms for our pasture walks and they're on the far right side of this chart. Okay, they're doing intensive grazing. Most of you in this room might be at that point. But to jump from continuous grazing to intensive grazing is never a good idea. Okay, there is a middle step and that's kind of what we want to talk about today. So Kevin and I came up with four different steps that we're going to go through um, called the easy way of um, continuously or rotationally grazing. So step one that we came up with was inventory. So first you have to look at what you have. So we're talking to producers that aren't necessarily getting started. You already have cows, you already have ground, and you're already grazing probably continuously. Maybe starting to think about rotationally grazing. Okay, so you need to look at the acreage. How much do you have to use there? What kind of perimeter fence do you have? Okay, what are your water sources? Because as we know, that's probably one of the biggest factors in laying out your paddocks is where's your water going to be? Another thing is the number of head. Are you looking to have less cattle, more cattle? Are you looking to diversify, maybe run some sheep in there? What are you looking to do with your animals? Do you have any current divisions? Okay, so all of these things are important to look at as you're going through. You need to know where you're starting so you can know where you want to go next. <coughs> Uh, so we thought that we would give kind of an example, a real life example that some people can relate to. Um, so for this particular example, this was cropland that was converted to pasture about two years ago and it was 56 <coughs> acres. So the orange triangle there is where the area was fenced. And there's a spring development there on the bottom kind of right hand corner of that uh, spring development. Um, it's a woven wire perimeter. Uh, this is continuously grazed right now and uh, 20 brood cows are on it. So about 1,500 pounds uh, per cow. Okay. So one of the things that we try to do when we're getting you set up is trying to convince you as to why, you know, I hear, again, all these excuses, too much time, cows won't disrespect, or, are disrespectful, why bother? They like to make hay, cows rotate themselves. The question becomes is, will this pay? And we'll get into that here in a little bit. But as we begin our evaluation process, uh, this evaluation process of figuring out how much forage do we have or how much forage do we need, we really need as grazers to begin to wrap our minds around how to calculate that. And that's where Caitlin and I get into this numbers game. We have a nice spreadsheet that we use called Graze 5, and it's available to you. We could send it to you. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. But if you can do basic math, you can figure out these balances along the way. The first thing that we want to look at, and that's where you can either go to the Web Soil Survey and get this information, or you can work with your local soil and water conservation district or your NRCS office and get this information on your farm. We want to take a look at the soil types that are on that farm. On average, most soils around will produce, have the ability with you know, minimal effort and <coughs> fertility to produce at least three ton to the acre of forage. You know, most, most uh, soils in Carroll County are somewhere between three and five tons to the acre we can produce. On this particular farm, if we took those soil types that were on, that was a farm that Caitlin actually, Caitlin and her husband actually farmed. We did that map work, and we calculated based on the soil types there that that 56 acres has the potential to produce 423,400 pounds of dry matter or forage on that 56 acres. That's a significant amount of feed, right? Okay. So you have to realize the reason you want to bother with that is the sheer economics of it. If you're going to continuously graze that 56 acres, you are only going to harvest 
about 30% of that forage. Okay. If you're trying to grow corn and I tell you, I can increase your yields by 250%, you're going to get excited about that. Right. I'd be, you'd be all ears. So, <laughs> all right. So you've got, I mean, we all, we've got a land base that we're working with. We've all either, we're either renting that land or we've purchased that land and we're paying, we bought it, we paid the mortgage on it, and we're paying taxes on it. Why in the world wouldn't you want to get that land to produce all that it can produce? And I'm here to tell you with a grazing system that's continuously grazed, you cannot maximize that forage production potential and the economics on that land if you're going to continuously graze. So of that 423,000 pounds, you're only going to harvest with continuously grazed 127,000 pounds of forage off of that. If we just switch to a 10 day rotation, which is what we're trying to do, we're going to go with the very basics. If we just switch to a 10 day rotation, we're going to increase from 30% to 50% right from the start. So that goes to 211,700 pounds of forage with a 10 day rotation that you're going to harvest. Okay. No, that means they're going to be on that paddock for 10 days. I'm not advocating that this is where we stop. We'll, you'll follow the thought process here. This is just trying to get you started. This is just the very basics and getting an individual that's continuously grazing just started in dabbling with this. So we go from a continuous to a 10 day. We automatically gain 20% efficiency on that grazing system. Okay. That's the equivalent of 84,680 pounds of forage or 85 round bales. Okay. I want to put it back in terms of the round bale thing that you guys would like to make. Hey, understand. Okay. And this is a little bit tongue in cheek, so don't take offense at it. But so we've determined how much forage we could produce on our land. Now we need to determine how much forage our animals need. So with this particular, you said 20 cows, Okay, we took the 20 cows, we need 900 pounds of forage dry matter per day, or just forage, just think of it as forage, and we arrived at it by uh, one 1,500 pound cow, and I'm not advocating large cows, but Caitlin says they got 1,500 pound cows. That cow will consume 3% of her body weight every day in forage dry matter. So it's just simple math, 1,500 pounds times 0 .03, each cow needs 45 pounds, you got 20 cows, you need 900 pounds of forage every day. Okay. So we've determined how much our land can produce and we've determined how much our livestock need need. So now we will begin to develop a plan as to how we can work with this land base to achieve that. Yeah. So just to get into thinking about kind of what you want to do. So we've thought about, you know, what we have, what kind of water system we have, what fence we have, how many animals we have. Now we've looked at what we have the potential to do. So now this is where you start getting into the plan making. So how often are you committed to moving the cows? We use the 10 day rotation because that's the first thing that comes up on our chart. Okay. That's like the first baby step that you could take. But a lot of times what we think of is a seven day rotation because if you work full time, you know, you could move those cattle on the weekends, just one time a week. And the next thing is the water situation. Like we said, it's the biggest limiting factor. So you want to think about that. Are you able to put in more water or are you stuck at the one watering point that you have? So what we did for this example is we stuck with one waterer because we don't have another way to get water down at the bottom there. Um, so for this example, we took a 56 acre pasture and we split it into three. So an 18, a 19 and a 19. So now we can easily start to think about how we're going to rotate through that. So this isn't intense grazing. Okay. This is just our first step towards moving there. So you can see, I put the orange lines down through there, just straight lines back across with the fence, um, fenced out the little woodland area there so they can access one waterer from all three of the paddocks. Okay, the next thing that Caitlin asked me to do, and that's probably the, the thought that we would have is, okay, that's all well and good. How much is that going to cost me? Okay, and what we did, 
they just went on to our, our ArcGIS map, and we just and we can do that. Uh, if you got Google Earth, you can do it too. But we just uh, measured off the lineal foot of fence. If you want to back up one, back up. All we did was take the orange lines, or all I did was take the orange lines and calculate the lineal feet of that, so that we know how many feet of fence that we would uh, like to install. Now, one thing that I did with this particular example, I looked at a two-strand electrified high tensile fence because one of the biggest things that I hear you know, or the biggest frustrations that a beginner grazer will have is you go ahead and you string up a bunch of poly wire, what happens? Huh? Shout it out. Huh? Why? Deer. The deer knock it down, they've got it strung all over the place, the cattle hit it, you've got a tangled up mess. That's the last thing I want to have is a beginner grazer frustrated with a disaster. You're going to go out there and you're going to have that, you're going to spend all day screwing around setting this up and then they go out in the evening and you get that white stuff strung all over the place and you're going to lose, you're going to lose the affinity for grazing pretty quick. So what I looked at here was just keep this fairly simple. You might get by with a one strand electrified high tensile. I just went with two just to try to control things. Just keep it simple and try to control things and don't put a lot of money into some of the initial division fences because they're likely to change. So what I looked at, you can go ahead and move ahead. We looked at the total length of the fence. All we need even to meet NRCS standards is a six inch for two strand wire. It's just a good six inch pull post you can get that set three to four foot in the ground, you can pull off of that with two wire and not have to build a bunch of brace posts. And then I just looked at electrifying it and using just T-post. T-post are something that, that an individual can go out with a, with a hand pounder that you can buy relatively cheap. You don't need a driver. You know, again, keep this to where you can do this without buying a post pounder and a bunch of additional equipment and go out there and build this fence in an afternoon or two afternoons. But with that, I went on and went and did, you know, real-time prices on that. That cost of that fence to install that less the fencer is under $1,200, okay? So I just wanted to go through that. So before we move on to getting a little different kind of rotation we just wanted to kind of sum up what happens when you change from a 10-day rotation so going from continuous to 10 days you're increasing that efficiency by 20 percent and that's the whole goal of trying to rotate more you want to utilize the most out of your pasture that you can so we said that that was the equivalent of 85 round bales so I want you to think about what that means to you in your operation so if you make your own hay think about the time that that takes Okay, think about the money that you sell that for. Think about how many of your cows that might feed. Or if you're someone that has to buy hay, think about that kind of price. What does that mean to you? So that's kind of why we wanted to put it for the round bale so you could think about it in real time money. Okay, so when we said that it's gonna cost around $1,200, we can say that this system pays for itself in the first year. If we're saving 85 round bales, this system can easily pay for itself in one year. So when we look ahead to getting a little more into grazing, we think about bumping to a seven day rotation. And like I've mentioned, that's ideal because that's the one time a week. If you work, you can do it on the weekends. So that goes up to a 60% efficiency. If you go to a five day rotation, it's up to 65 and a three day rotation is a 70%. So we put the amount of dry matter forage up there so you can see that and also the amount of round bales. So if you would go all the way to a three-day rotation, that would be from switching from continuous to rotational, that would be the equivalent of about 170 round bales. That's how much forage you would be utilizing that you weren't when you were continuously grazing. It's the equivalent of leaving 170 round bales in that field and not touching them. Okay. Now, the real question becomes, in order to implement this, we've got to have water. Now, where's Pete at? Are you talking at all about water? Okay. All right. I didn't want to get into that if you were going to get into it. But 
when it comes to water, you know, for all those of you that have been coming to our pasture walks, we almost always take a look at the individual's water on the farm that we're at. And there are a lot of ways that we can accomplish this. But in order to get into this more intensive uh, type grazing systems, uh, we have got to have water. And, and I know we talk about having water within 800 feet. I don't even like to throw that number out there anymore because I'm a firm believer that in order to make these systems succeed, we've just got to have water in front of them. We've got to have water in front of them. And it's so based on the topography on this particular farm you don't know that i do because i've been on the farm but right there at the, at the point where that stock tank is that's all uphill for those livestock that is all the way at the top of the hill and up over the crest of the hill so what's going to happen if we try to use that as our sole source of water we're going to have a train wreck because we're going to have trails up and down the hill we're going to have a huge group going up and down the hill that's never going to work so we have to look at ways to distribute uh, this water uh, there, there's lots of different ways that we can do this uh, you know, we can do this with simple pumping systems. Uh, what's that? Huh? That's easy. Downhill. It's, down, it's downhill. We're, we're up just a little bit. I mean, we got to go up over a hill there. But yeah, we could go downhill. Uh, you know, we might look at a siphon system, simple pump system. Uh, we don't have to have everything buried all over these. If, if we're talking about grazing from April through November, we don't need to worry about going out there and burying all this line right off the bat. You know, you may want to do that in time if you're thinking about being able to use this through the winter. But for the most part, 90% of our grazing season, we can graze with overland water lines. So let's just simplify this. Let's let, not let water be the limiting factor. If we've got a stock tank or a big tire tank sitting at the top of that hill, let's get creative. I was at a farm uh, this fall and this guy was pumping 300 feet up on the hill and we always think about how hard it is to pump water that high up on the hill you know what he was using he's using a pressure washer pump he figured out it's it, it he could pump water at four gallons a minute using an old pressure washer and he was you know doing a water and dairy heifers so he got real creative with a simple pump pushing it with a one inch line way up over the hill to a, a, a cistern on the top of the hill so we can move water just a matter of getting creative with doing that. But as we begin to uh, look at more divisions, this, this is what it would look like. If we, if we get started here, you know, we would have, you know, the pie sheet uh, system. And then we can look at taking where we had put the, the two strand electrified. Then we just get, get some poly rope or some step in post and whatnot. And Pete will talk about some of this. Uh, and then get your water distributed out there and then just start divvying that thing up. That's what you're going to find. Once you get started, the biggest thing with uh, grazing systems is just getting started with something because you're going to immediately see the benefit. And once you start seeing the benefit, it's going to intrigue you and your curiosity is going to get the better of you. And you're going to keep dividing and keep dividing and keep dividing. And you're going to find ways to make it work because it will work. And uh, I know that, what is uh, Bob Hendershot say they've actually measured in forage production. Clint, do you recall? It's like 14,000. They, they, where we thought we might be able to get four, five, six tons, they're getting seven tons of the acre. I mean, seven and eight tons of the acre with good management. I don't know that all of our soils in these uh, in these unglaciated areas can do that, but you don't know until you build a root structure. So, all right. I had showed this a while back. I don't know. Pete, kick the lights off there a minute. Maybe they'll be able to see this better. Okay, I don't remember if you guys, not all everybody was here, but uh, this has to do a lot with rest, and it has to do a lot with what we're doing with our grasses this time of the year. Uh, these were samples that I had pulled off of our farm, I think, two years ago. And this is really interesting because we pulled this off uh, during spring growth. Uh, what this represents, this top picture here, we've got three different samples of orchard, it happens to be orchard grass. On the right, uh, that small plant on the right was a piece of grass or a clump of grass that was grazed. It was, it was in the winter lot where we, where we feed hay, but they have access to the back paddock and so they were chewing on that all winter long. The center one was a, it came out of a paddock where we had grazed in the fall. Uh, tried to leave a little bit of height there, uh, but 
it had been grazed in the fall and maybe a little bit in the early winter. And the one on the left was a plant that was along the fence line that had never been grazed at all in the fall or winter. And then we were all talking about uh, what was happening on our pastures come spring. And, oh, we didn't have grass, we didn't have grass. And I showed that the, the what we're doing in the fall, in the winter months, like now, is having an enormous impact on what happens to our paddocks next spring. If we're if we're out there now slogging around in the mud and overgrazing these pastures now, don't expect a lot of early spring growth. Uh, but that just shows that that proved a lot to me in the value of the heavy use pad and and the value of watching how much we were grazing in the fall and in the winter time as to what I could expect to have happen in the spring. And that left a lasting impression on me. Uh, you got to have you got to have roots, uh, and you got to have some green to get that to take off in the spring. So, okay. These were some examples of regrowth that where'd you pull this off of? Oh, these are the same ones. Okay. So, it's just showing you what we're trying to accomplish here with the amount of growth and the number of paddocks and the amount of rest as to how much regrowth and how fast we can get regrowth to occur on this grass. You have to have green to grow green and if you're overgrazing uh, and in a continuous system where you are overgrazing uh, what happens is those animals will go back in and they'll start picking on that green that we're trying to grow, we're trying to harness up solar energy and they will pick on that. So by increasing the number of paddocks we're going to increase the amount of rest and we're going to increase the amount of green. We increase the amount of green, we're going to increase the amount of forage that we're growing. Okay. Okay. okay so the important thing to remember with this is that you don't always need to be following that plan exactly. Those days don't really mean a whole lot. I mean, they do, but if you're out there and you have no grass, you should probably be moving to the next paddock. So I don't want you to think, you know, seven days, seven days, seven days, that's what I have to be moving my animals at, because that's not true. You need to be using what's called a grazer's eye. Okay, pay attention to the weather. Are you in a drought? Did you have a lot of rain this month? So it's important to take those into account, even if you have a plan. Okay, so looking back over the grazing season is really important because even if you have a plan, it's okay to change that from year to year. And winter is a really good time to look back over your record sheets and what happened in the past year and think about what can I improve on next season? What was really hard for me this past year? Did I not have enough grass? Did I have too much grass? Did I need to supplement for hay? Think about those things and be making your rotations and planning for this year to make that easier for yourself and make sure that those cows are working for you. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is the grazing record sheet, and this is part of a grazing management plan if you have one, and I handed these out when everyone walked through the door. I think these are really handy, and I know a lot of our producers have their own kind of sheets that they go through, and this is an Excel sheet, so it can be filled in on the computer. Uh, but the thing that I like about this is you can look back on what's been applied to that field. If you took manure on there, lime fertilizer, if you had to do any spray applications, you know where that was done and in which paddocks. And then you can also uh, put all of your grazing information on there. So you can list your paddock numbers, put when those animals went into there and how tall the grass was, and then the day that you took them out and how short that was. And this is also where you can record any information that may have happened during that season. So if the grass got eaten down in one of your paddocks, you could make a note in there, you know, that that may have had some damage during a drought. Um, you might have had some compaction after a rainstorm in one of your paddocks. That would be important to put on a note in there so you can look back the next year and think, how was what I did last year affecting me this year? Um, so just kind of to wrap up, uh, the whole point of this, as I mentioned in the beginning, is the more you rotate, the higher that efficiency is going to be. So we went through the four steps today. We started with inventory. Where am I now? We did evaluation. Where can I be? And then we made a plan. Where do I want to go? 
So the last thing we did is consider the cost. So you have to think about all of those things for your operation. Hey, maybe you have multiple water sites, or maybe you have a farm where you don't have good water and you need to work around that. So this is different for everyone. Everyone's paddock system, everyone's grazing system, your animals, and how long you've been doing this too. That's why we love to have these meetings because everyone's insight, you know, as you talk amongst other grazers and what you've kind of went through, it's really important to hear. Well, just uh, you kind of wrap this up, you know, we've got people in here from all different counties and probably threw a lot of information at you. I just, if you're, let's do this. If you are with a, a local, so if you're a local soil water conservation district employee, would you stand up or an NRCS employee? All right. Josh, which county do you service? Harrison and Carroll. All right, you two guys. What are you? Stark. Stark? Stark, yep. Okay, how about you two? Uh, I got a list of Jersey Noble, or Jersey Carroll, Dust, Harrison Jefferson. All right, Pete. From Vienna. I'm already standing. You're already standing. <laughs> Harry. All right. Beth. Clint. <laughs> All right, Stu. Harrison. Kim. Carol. Caitlin. Carol. And I serve as Carol and Tusk. The point is, if you're in any of those counties, you've got people that you can call on for resources, and we'd be glad to come out and help walk through your farm specifically and, and try to give you ideas to get started with this. You know, it is intimidating if, you, if you're just kind of new to this, but it's our goal to help you succeed. Uh, that's what we get paid to do is to give you the tools to help you succeed we're not out there to tell you what to do we're out there to give you the ideas and, and just uh, feed you the information to help you along I know you know on our farm the services that I got from our local people were invaluable and that's what got me started so yeah right. another thing to mention with that because it's always interesting to me when we leave someone's farm they say how much do i owe you you don't owe us anything when we come out and help you it does not cost you anything so please utilize these services if you need a grazing plan done we will be more than happy to help you with that yeah. i like blueberry cheesecake yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right do we have any questions from the group okay The question that he has is if you were planning on cattle, and I'll just kind of paraphrase what he said, you are, you're, you're set up, you've got a good high, high tensile electrified wire around the perimeter, but you were planning on cattle and now you find yourself maybe looking at sheep and goats. What are your options? Now I have a little bit of experience with the sheep. I don't have any experience with goats, but what I would say is number one, a good fencer. Number two, uh, the things that I have worked with, and if there's anybody else in the crowd that has worked with any of this stuff, feel free to interject. I would uh, look at some netting. Uh, you might find netting will work with sheep and goats, again, with a good fencer. And I have used a, uh, a Gallagher, what do they call that, a smart fence. It's got multiple poly wire on it. Now, I have used that with the sheep. Again, I don't know about the goats. Sheep can be a challenge. If they get you get one that's headstrong, they are hard to keep in. I don't know. Anybody else have that experience with sheep and goats? Huh? Do you have anything that you really like that works really well? Move them every day. Move them every day. Keep them moving. They know they're going to be competing in grade three. And they do. Once they, once they don't 
think you're coming. They do, and I tell you, 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 you wait just a little too long, that's the thing. Those sheep will rush you. They do it to me. It irritates me to no end, but they will. Or if they figure out they can get under a fence, you know, that wool, I don't know, they'll go where it, what keeps a buffalo in, those sheep will go right under it. So, but I would, you know, maybe try, you know, can't go out and put all the woven wire up, but I would maybe try some of that netting. Have you ever tried the netting? I will tell you this. If you think deer are bad and folly wise, you should see what the goats weren't doing in netting. Yeah, okay. And I have had sheep get, I have had lambs get tangled up in that netting too. I think so. it's one of those things you almost got to set up a training pen. Yeah. Sort of yeah. 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 We got goats at our work, and we electrified the bottom three strands of our uh, high tension electric fence. And really hot. Yeah. 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 220. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but no, it did turn them around. So. Yeah. But you got to really snap them. Yeah. 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 But I, w I would try a training pen and get them accustomed to it and then. I'm, 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 I'm going to say I'm brilliant. I guess. <laughs> you know, the cows and stuff that I'm Yeah, and I've seen that cattle. Right. Interesting enough, I don't know whether you know Brian Burgard or not. He had, they got Burgard Angus Farm. They're just outside of town. He was in today, and they run sheep and goats. And I had a conversation with him about good doing a pasture walk where they're doing multi-species grazing like that, just because I think there's going to be an interest in that, and he might be a good resource for us to see what is actually working for him. I know he has spacing that he has set up on his electrified uh, high tensile wire that he likes and he uses. He's, I can't recall off the top of my head what it is, but he uses it to, you know, just high tensile wire for the sheep and the goats and the cattle, but he's got a spacing on that that he likes and it works for him. But So, all right. Any other comments on that? I actually have another, I had another question. Okay, that's fine. That, that was kind of both. I mean, the middle one was kind of more, and I don't truly stockpile. That was probably more of just a managed grace system into the into the winter. We probably, I, I can't recall because I haven't unrolled hay on those pastures for a good while after I started seeing that, but what we typically were doing then was just kind of managing the grass and unrolling over a short period of time, maybe no longer than seven to ten days in a paddock and then taking them out of there, but it was done during the winter time. Whereas the one on the far right was just open access to that back paddock, you know, through the through the winter as we were feeding hay on that paddock, it wasn't. But I, I would I would think you're going to see similar effects of that on stockpile too. You just kind of got to watch it. So, and I think Cliff's seen some of that. You know, how tight you graze it during the winter time and the effect that that has in the spring on your regrowth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dead hot stuff, or do you bring stuff underneath, or everything? Like the brown stuff that's standing up that they're grazing on. Yeah. I thought those are young for you. No. You want to try to graze that stockpile like you would regular. Don't get down in those t those fresh tillers and everything else. You know, going into you're, you're going to hurt yourself. You know, and just try to make sure we have enough green. You know, you have to remember that that grass plant is a lot like a tree. It's a lot like a tree. It's going to be storing up the energy in the fall, 
to reshoot those tillers in the spring, just like a tree, you know, puts the sugars down in the root system to relief in the spring. It's the same concept, you know, and if we hurt that, then that regrowth is going to be drastically reduced in the spring. And that's, I think we hurt ourselves a lot in the fall. So, all right. Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, Pete, I think you're up with some tools and tricks of the trade for doing some division. We'll all be around after the meeting for to answer any other questions. All right, so uh, my name is Pete Conkle. Uh, my dad's over here. We actually farm um, just outside of Hanoverton. And uh, we run a small operation. We're going to have out about 50 cows there this spring. Uh, we're running on stockpile right now. Fred was able to do his entertainment without any props. Unfortunately, I have to bring lots of props because um, I'm just not that humorous as Fred. So, um, but uh, so we do run on stockpile. This is uh, actually what we consider the mature cow group. This would be coming three-year-olds to some cows that are 14, 15, and that was November. And um, <clears throat> I know everybody thinks you got to have, you know, high-end fence and lots of it and all that, but all that is is uh, one strand of poly tape or poly wire running east-west and then one strand of poly tape running uh, north-south. And those 40 cows were getting about four tenths of an acre every day, moving moving wires. So we're still on stockpile with that group. We had to actually um, give up on stockpile last week when we kind of got that ice and then snow and then more snow. Um, but this week we're back on it. They're giving me some dirty looks, but you just kind of move the fence, turn around, walk back to the house. So um, it, you do have to have a. My future wife tells me I have no heart. I don't know if that's the truth, but you just kind of got to do it, you know. So, all right, hit the button. Um, so rotational grazing. Uh, May say that rotational grazing is flexibility. Uh, things to consider, forage availability, stocking rate, those nutritional needs, and then other times, um, other things to think about, it's time of year, and the weather conditions. Uh, we've got some floodplain area down by that creek bottom. Obviously, I don't want to have those cattle down there come March um, because I'm just going to ask for a visit from the Ohio Department of Agriculture if we're mudding up those areas and that silt and sediment and manure is getting into the stream. Um, you know, Fred mentioned the really nasty bales um, or more mature bales, gunk hay, I guess they call it. I personally, we, we try and run a little bit smaller cow, you know, that 1250 to, or yeah, 1250 to 1400 pound cow. We're not calving until April to May. I have a problem with cows getting too fat. So last week when we were, um, when we had to abandon stockpile, I was actually unrolling what I call bed and breakfast hay. They can either eat it or they can lay on it and, and do their business on it. So I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use some of that junk hay. You just bring it on up anytime you feel like. Um, but uh, you know that that is one of the great things about this uh, of the grazing is it is very flexible. You don't have to, you know, it's not by the. It's, there's books out there, but nothing is uh, is set in stone. And um, we'll go through a little bit of like what I do on our operation. You know, mom and dad and my sister, brother-in-law, everybody kind of pitches in when need be. Um, and it, it makes it enjoyable for the most part. Um, not every day is sunshine and roses, but um, we get along all right. Hit it. Okay, um, talking about boundary fence, high tensile electric, I, most of our fence is, um, especially the boundary stuff, is high tensile electric. Uh, you know, whether we're controlling them with subdivision, um, we do have two and three strand subdivision that I like, and we'll go down to one strand subdivision on the yearlings. Um, it is a physical and a psychological barrier. You know, we can shock them, and then once they're shocked once, you know, usually they don't try it again. 
and low cost. You know, we can stretch out those posts, you know, especially on those subdivisions. We've got some fences that are, or, uh, some posts that are 50, 100 feet apart. So, because we don't have to, you know, it's not actually a physical barrier at that point. We're just creating that thought that they can't go through it. Um, lighter end bracing too, you know, if we're only building three strand high tensile and maybe two of those are hot, we don't have to have, you know, big eight, 10 inch posts four or five feet in the ground, we can get by with something a little bit less. Um, but I, all of our fence, you hit the next button. This is uh, where I live. All the red fence is high tensile, at least four strand. Up in that northwest corner is um, kind of some training lots and some sorting pens that we've got. All that six strand high tensile. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the navy blue box is actually our uh, little feedlot like We've got a little holding pen there we kind of catch the bulls up in and then we've got a working facility underneath the white roof there but um, the lighter blue that's all two strand subdivision fence we can heat that up if need be or we don't have to necessarily make it hot but a lot of times we'll pull off of that <laughs> like we'll uh i'll hook um poly tape or poly wire on that one that's running down the center and i'll run towards the blue or towards the red and uh, we can subdivide. In fact, you can see it up here in that, I don't know if you guys can, that uh, northeast corner, there's actually a dozen or so heifers, and you can see where our poly wire is that day. We've you know kind of basically split that in half. <clears throat> We've got, and then the purple is all uh, one strand high tensile. I like to know how many acres we're getting or we're giving these cattle. So like the purple, every increment is 210 feet. So I know like if I go half, then I'm giving them, I've already got one set. So I know if I'm giving them a half an acre, I can step it off, give them half an acre, whole acre or whatever, if that makes any sense. Um, but that's just what we do at the yearling place. Um, we do have a little bit more, a uh, little bit, uh, better fence up towards the barn because you know we're bringing cattle into AI during July and and stuff like that or we um, you know when we turn them yearlings out they've been cooped up all winter we kind of got to retrain them on uh, on some of the poly wire and poly tape so we kind of uh, get them a little training pad off there all right I was hoping John McCarns was here tonight because I found this picture on the internet but we do want to keep this flank, uh, fence flexible. If you can tell from the back, that those are all pallets and cyclone panels that are wired together. But we do, when you're moving these cattle every day or every seven days or every three days, it's a chore. It can be a, a pain to go out there and move them. And, um, but if we keep it flexible, <clears throat> keep it manageable, it's, it's kind of enjoyable. So if you want to hit that for me. Um, all right, so you got two choices, either poly wire or poly tape. I did bring reels of both. Um, these are some uh, these are some of our reels that we like to use. This is a what they call an economy reel, and what I do is I buy uh, the 1,650 feet of poly wire, and then um, I cut it. I cut 550 foot increments and put 550 feet on each one of these rolls so I know how much is on there. I can go out, set two or three days worth of fence pretty quick. It doesn't really take too awful long. And if you've never seen uh, the poly wire, there's actually three to six strands or nine strands of um, metal woven in there. We buy the stuff with the stainless because in your notes you'll read that uh, stainless isn't quite as good as conductor is what aluminum is, but the aluminum will actually work harden over time. It'll get brittle, start breaking, you'll lose your conductivity, and um, you'll have cattle out. So we do buy the stainless. We get a lot more lifespan out of it. Um, I like it. These reels aren't geared, so it does take a little bit more effort to crank them up. Um, this is a newer type handle that they've come out with. So I don't like to work on the fence when it's hot. And, um, but what you can do is they've actually got an extra hook on here. So you can hook that on there. You can hook that onto your hot fence and then you can string your fence 
come back, put your posts in, get everything tight the way you want it, and then all you got to do is just unhook and then put your metal clamp right on the hot wire. So um, I've kind of gone away from the spring-loaded fence posts or the fence handles anymore between cattle wrecking them and the deer and whatever else is out there. Um, we just, we're not finding, these are like three bucks, four bucks. So they're, I like them. I, they're pretty handy. Um, we don't, I wouldn't recommend if you've got a cow calf operation and you're calving in the spring, this is probably not the place to start with poly wire. Um, it's just, it's hard for them to see. Uh, they don't pick up on it right away. My favorite setup for, um, for cows and calves when we're getting cranking there in the spring is, uh, are these type reels. And all this is, is a $7 Lowe's, um, electric cord reel, but you know, you can put, uh, about 500 feet of, um, poly tape on these. I like the poly tape a little bit better because they can, they can see it. It'll flap in the wind. I actually picked this up from Cliff at one of his pasture walks. It's fastening these snaps on the end. We can go hook it on our hot wire. Obviously when it's not on, we do unplug the fence a lot. Hook it on, string our fence, and then um, I'm thrifty. So I save all these little pieces when I'm running underground wire. And, uh, and then I can fish these through, hook it on my other outside high tensile, and I'm done. So you can call me cheap if you want, but it, it saves time and money and effort. But I do like the, the poly tape, especially, like I said, for training young calves and that sort of thing. Um, they say that the white is a little bit better uh, for seeing, you know, for them to pick it up as far as um, at nighttime and things like that. We haven't run into too many problems with it being orange. So, um, you know, use your own preference there, I guess. Um, so, do you guys carry it? We, we do, but uh, those are probably most, most easily found at straight A's. Uh, they're Gallagher. Right. Most of the time. Straight A's is one of our sponsors. They do carry it. And I know, um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but if you've not found Ken Cove and you're interested in grazing, I would definitely get on their mailing list. These people are really great to work with. They're very knowledgeable when you call them. Um, they've got salespeople that can actually help you. And they're not just trying to sell a product. Um, and I know like straight A's, they they will, they can put an order in for you and get free shipping and things like that. So again, your local connection would be straight A's in Malvern or Minerva. But um, ju just having this Kenco catalog is very handy at times. You can go in and look at stuff and um, decide what you need. So you can have that one. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, one other thing, uh, sometimes we're in spots where we can't, um, get connection or jump. We got to use a jumper. They do sell these little alligator clips with uh, a little bit of wire. I do like having a half a dozen of these around. It just makes it easier if I'm, you know, if I'm going from one hot uh, to a fence that's maybe not. I can just clip it on, make it hot real quick. Uh, those just seem to be real handy. This is um, This is an O'Brien geared reel. There's about 1,650 feet of poly wire on these. Uh, right now we're on stockpile grass, like I said, and it doesn't take much to keep those old cows in. So a lot of the times I'll run this on our perimeter. We actually, um, my parents' farm is separated from my farm by Route 30, so we actually have to truck those 40 cows over to stockpile grass. Instead of building a lot of um, high tensile fence on the perimeter and then, you know, trying to maintain that through the summer because we'll, that's where we make our hay, um, it's just easier for me to go around and put up a couple strands or one strand of poly wire um, on the perimeter and then we can pull off of that. So um, we do keep some of these geared reels around, like that first picture that I showed you. Um, we could 
there's nine acres in that field. We can, you know, run this poly wire out. I kind of hold it on the four wheeler. We can run it out. It kind of serves either a subdivision fence or our perimeter fence or things like that. But these gear reels are really nice because you can wind up a lot of fence in a hurry. The only problem is that like when you get to the last two or 300 feet and you think you're cooking and got the day whip, that thing's going to bird nest and you're going to have this conglomeration of poly wire <laughs> around it. Kevin's done it. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Uh, you're going to have this bird's nest around this reel and it's, yeah, it's not a lot of fun, but um, you can invent some new curse words when you do that. Uh, so those are, those are the types of reels and fencing that we have. Like I said, for the most part, I really like just the $7 electrical wire uh, winder. We can put a lot of tape on there and um, they're light and easy. Everybody can pick them up and move with them and stuff like that. All right. Uh, okay, so reels, posts, and insulated. We went over the reels. Posts um, is another one that uh, everybody seems to have a hard time deciding on what to do. Uh, TSC and everybody sells these, right? Everybody's seen these with the different levels and things like that that you can put them at. You know, uh, as far as multi-species grazers, these are great. Or like when we fence line wean calves, we, we can use a few of these and then we can run two strands of height or a poly wire and it makes a pretty impenetrable fence. But I don't like these for our daily moves because I have short little fat fingers and I can't hold very many of these. So if I'm wanting to carry 10 or 12, I'd probably invent some sort of quiver or something like that. That's not happening. So, um, the other thing is that you'll notice that uh, a lot of these will break. And the other thing that happens is that when you drop that poly wire down in there and then try and pull it up, it gets snagged and it'll stretch your wires and everything else. So, I just, I don't, I'm not a big fan of these. If you are and they're working for you, great, but I'm not sold on them. My favorite is the pigtail. Uh, these are Gallagher's. You don't have to buy Gallagher's, but uh, these are like extra heavy. Even two weeks ago when we had all that frozen ground and we were on stockpile, you could still kind of get these in. I think the last two or three days there when it was really cold, I had to use a cordless drill and a mortar bit to drill a pilot hole. But um, these are fairly heavy. Uh, but you can also, like if you're wanting to do multi-species or have a second wire, you can slip one of those um, screw-on Western insulators on. And uh, I just really like these. You, I, can, I can carry 12, 14 of these in one hand and a reel in the other, and I can set a lot of fence in a short amount of time. So my pick is the pigtail post. Um, the other one that I really like and we've been using a little bit more of is uh, the 3 8 fiberglass rod. These come from Ken Cove again. Be these are uh, covered with the sun protector, the UV resistant, so you're not picking up shards of the fiberglass. These have uh, these little rat tail clips on them, and uh, you just drop the wire down inside there. You can adjust it to whatever height you want. Again, you can put a lot of these in, very little problem. They do send a cap that you can put over top of it and pound those posts in if need be. Um, we use these quite a bit, like in our two strand high tensile or subdivision fencing, we can stretch that fence and then go in and these just kind of hold them up, you know, like a, basically like a stay. But um, I, do, I do like the fiberglass ones. They're probably a little bit more for my permanent fencing versus stuff I'm taking down every day and things like that. <clears throat> I put the, uh, picture of the guy in there on the four-wheeler because he seems to be all about it. I don't know that anybody, Kevin, you might be the only one that's that intense. <laughs> I bet you Sarah give you 10 kinds of grief you cut one of her Tupperware containers in half like that though. Uh, all right. I, w I did want to mention a couple things on insulators. Um, there's a new 
new tube insulator that's come out. It's uh, one of the spiral locks, and um, it's good for guys like me that build fans and then go, oh, shoot, I forgot to slide an insulator on there. What happens is this um, spiral lock will actually spin on there. Sure will, Pete. <laughs> Anyhow, it spins on here, and then you just zip tie it closed, and then like if you if you got a cross wire or your diagonal on your corner brace, and uh, it's touching, you can spin that on there, zip tie it in. Now you've created that insulation factor. Those are pretty handy. It's almost worth buying um, 25 or whatever they sell a bucket of them just to have them around. Um, if you were at the October pasture walk at Farm board cattle. We talked a little bit about the wraparounds. Uh, Sean Weaver was there from Weaver Fence. And um, we've noticed we were lo losing an awful lot of voltage in our fence at the wraparounds. I don't know whether they've cheapened up the plastic or, you know, sometimes we've seen some rodents chewing on those things at the corners where the wraparounds are. So we've switched and uh, everything we're building new is now getting the double U insulator. And then I'm slowly trying to switch out all my old insulator, old wraparounds. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, this, uh, like if this is your corner post here, this wraps around like this, this is your post, and then your hot wire is going to hook in here and go out this way, okay? And if you've got hot gates, you know, where you touch your, your metal gate and it's hot, most likely it's shortened through your wraparound and then hitting one of your hinge points or something like that. This will, these double U's, whether they're ceramic or plastic, um, will eliminate those, those hot gates. So not to throw one more item onto your spring to-do list, but uh, these double U's I think are the way to go if you're gonna be building new fence. Yeah, it does motivate you, yes. <laughs> um, one other insulator that I like, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the tube nail on or uh, staple on insulators. I do like the pin locks. This is a, happens to be a Gallagher. So this will pin onto your fence post and then your high tensile will run through here and then you can just lock it on like that. So if you're having problems with deer that are blowing through all the time, the most that you're going to have to replace is uh, that pin. They might shear it off, but you're not going to have to be out there looking for staples and things like that. So I think it adds another dimension to the fence, and I, it, I think it gives a um, uh, – I think it, the way that those cattle see the fence, I think it kind of almost gives a 3D vision to the fence, and they have a hard time picking up where the hot wire is, so they don't seem to want to push up against it as much. I don't know, that's just my theory. Um, but like, you know, that's sticking out inch and a half or something from your fence post where all your other are tied up against the post. So it's, they just don't seem to put as much pressure on that um, perimeter or boundary fence if we've got those. Uh, even on our two and three strand, we're using those. We can drop them if need be, if a tree falls on them or something like that. or we're in a really big hurry and we just want to drop it and try and get the cattle across, we've, we've done that as well. All right, on to the next. Okay, so chargers. Uh, this is everybody's, this can always be your weakness. Um, you're going to want to go with a low impedance charger uh, because those weed choppers, the old bulldozers and stuff like that that we used to run, those are basically gonna melt this fence. It's gonna create really hot and um, temperature-wise, not shock-wise. And so that's why you wanna choose uh, low impedance. And then you wanna look at the jewels when you're looking at that. Uh, better, they're better suited for the rotational grazing. They're gonna resist that volt leakage. And um, the higher the jewel rating, the greater shocking potential over a longer line of fence and uh, it'll be able to still shock through those weeds because you're getting out a shorter bolt. Um, there at the bottom of that, double the jewels and you'll double the shock. And uh, so, you know, just something to keep in mind when you're looking through catalogs or, you know, straight A's again is a good source. Sean and Nate 
you know, if you're looking for fencers and things like that, they can really help out with that. But uh, all I can say is probably buy the biggest fencer that your money can buy. All right. So again, um, switching back to voltage, because you'll see voltage and joules on your fencer. I don't want to get into a long discussion on that. Um, minimum of 700. Pigs are really easy to break to electric fence if you've ever tried. They're, they're pretty easy, especially if you're using like poly tape. They see it, it's flapping a little bit, they'll go up, get shocked once. You won't see them the rest of the day, but then the next day they're back out. Pigs are pretty easy to graze. Um, minimum of 2,000 volts for the longer haired cattle. Um, I, and then 4,500 to 7,000 is usually somewhere in there, but uh, we do carry fence testers. I've got one for dad's truck, one for each of mine, and we've got a floater. Um, I start getting nervous and start looking for shorts once that thing drops below 3,500 volts. Fence tester is 100 bucks. It's a lot of peace of mind because they make them now or they're, they'll just, they're about to, mine's actually locked in the truck. I should have brought it, but. Um, it'll fit in your shirt pocket. You take that thing out, check it. There you go. See what your volts are. Some of the better ones will even show you the direction of the fault. Uh, they're just pretty handy to have. So, um, grounding. All right. So this is where the major, most of the problems arise. People just don't get their fences grounded right. Uh, we've seen it where they've tried to run copper wire out and then that goes to a stainless post or a galvanized post and if, do a little research, uh, but this doesn't take a lot. Just get at least three, you know, six foot galvanized grounding rods, get the good clamps, run one 12 and a half gauge wire from your fencer out, get those grounding rods 10 feet apart at least. Try and keep them, you know, maybe at the drip line of the barn or something and get that fence hot. Uh, I know we've got um, down at the home place, I think there's eight or nine grounding rods on that one up at mom or my place, there's six or seven. And, you know, we're consistently running 5,600 volts up there at home. We'll push 7,000. So I don't really have any fears of cattle working that fence if, if we're hitting that hot. They don't even really get close to it if it's that hot. Um, basically all I said there and uh, some of the other thoughts there, um, you want to make sure they're where they're visible. Everybody's got these zero turn mowers right now. We lose a couple clamps and things every year. Always keep a few spares that you can clamp the wires back on. I, I kind of learn to put them on the inside of the fence next to a fence post so that at the worst somebody might hit it with a weed eater or something but other than that um, you know you just gotta you want to try and keep them out of the way but make sure they're usable um, like I say you know you want to connect that thing with one continuous wire you don't want a bunch of chunks of wire that you put together and then 50 feet away, at least from utilities, I've seen some where people have installed it. Next thing you know, the, when they turn the TV on, you can hear the fencers snapping through the TV and things. So one thing I did want to talk about was the shape of the pallet. And I'll just touch on this real quick so we can get out of here. But this is um, this was actually at my parents' place. And so the two solid lines were our um, subdivision fence. And then this... The uh, one dotted line, that was also a subdivision fence. And when we put cattle in down here at this south end, we put a cross wire here and try and get a day out of grazing of that. And <clears throat> cattle's habit is to, you know, get to the far end and then get back. And so they would be in there about two hours and you would have thought they were starving to death because all they did was walk from one end to other and back and they were just trampling all that grass so here about two years ago we took out the subdivision fence that is now the dotted line and we just made that one big pasture and now we can just go from one solid line across um, you know it's about 240 feet across there it takes eight or nine posts 
and we just you know we just make about three or four paddocks down through there depending on the time of year and uh, how many cattle are in the group and things like that but you know if you're grazing horses yeah you want that long rectangular shape to that paddock because they're going to be moving and grazing at the same time but with these cattle you want them in a more square tight paddock where they're going to get in put their heads down and uh, start grazing right away you don't want them walking you want them down with their heads down and eating um, i i don't know anybody that would build a circular type paddock Hans, you ever seen a circular um the triangular shaped ones i noticed this a lot with the water you know like kevin and them and caitlin talked about at the beginning uh, when, with their presentation, that water sometimes is our only source, so we've got a wagon wheel or pie shape off of that thing. And, you know, we've got, we might have some serious issues there with uh, soil abuse or manure buildup because of that. Um, but if you can avoid it, you know, those tight corners, you just want to avoid anything like that. I know even like this paddock, that northwest corner, it's kind of, it gets a little triangular shape. We don't get the utilization out of that that we typically would. I, I think they get in there, they get to feeling cramped or a little tight and they just, they don't spend as much time there. So we use a little, lose a little bit of utilization. That's back to the herd there. But um, I will say the only other thing I wanted to add was, uh, you know, you're talking about the goats and the sheep and stuff. If you've got hot headed cattle, that they're always got their heads up and looking for that out gate. This, these, it's going to be a nightmare putting this poly wire up and things like that. They're going to blow through, get into the next paddock, and then they're looking to go to the next one. So, you know, go to, if you can, get to some of these pasture walks or don't be afraid of calling these cows because there's, there's lots of cows out there right now that will fit your. Calmer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but they're, they're just like people. There's some real knotheads out there. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Right, right. I mean, yeah, I, I think they do. I think they mellow out. They're used to being around people. They're easier to load and move. Um, you know, we hauled 40 cows. That group of 40 was that three miles round trip or something in an hour and a half, you know, because we, we got a little bit of a bud box set there. We can, you know, we're not ramming and jamming them and, and using hot shots or anything like that. It just, yeah, I mean, these, just the docility alone, I think makes it worth having, makes it worth going into a rotational grazing. But yeah, if you've got one that she's throwing her head up all the time and one out, you better, you better find another hole for her. Right. Yeah, you will lose shock value the further you get out with the poly wire or the tape. The poly wire will carry um, a more intense shock further than what the tape will. But um, and you sure wouldn't want your poly wire being your energy source. You know, you wouldn't want to pull off of it too many times. You're you're always going to get the best best shock value or <clears throat> best jolt for your with your high tensile wire. I don't know if some of the NRCS guys got any numbers on any of that, how much voltage it loses in a thousand feet or anything. I don't remember, but it, it is significant. It falls off the poly wire. It goes over a year or a thousand feet or a couple thousand volts. <coughs> Can you go back to that map? One thing I did want to show you guys before we, um, or even the frog picture where that frog was on that insulator. So, yeah, there you go. So, uh, I don't have a whole lot of money, so I tend to be tricky. So, I don't, 
I'm not a big fan of a lot of gates, but like um, on that uh, on that aerial photo where the purple strands were, we needed to be able to get cattle both ways. So what we done is uh, I built these poly rope gates. So people dead. Thank you. So like where that frog sitting, those are that's our perimeter hot wire, and then um, we just got those uh, connectors again out of Kenco. We come up with a hot wire. All you gotta do, they get the gist. I can I can open that gate from either end. Okay, I'm not in a fixed position. So um, if I've got heifers on the south side and I want to come to the north side, you know we can either unhook Caitlin's end or my end or take the whole thing down if we want and bring heifers through. And same with, uh, same with on the east end or the west end, we've got them on, on both sides so that we don't have to worry about which way they're coming or if they're opening gates or how we're gonna do that. These, I mean, they sell the kit again in that and uh, you just, you can buy like 500 feet of this poly rope, some handles, and uh, it just makes some pretty inexpensive and again flexible gates that aren't too bad. And even if they tear these apart, the most you're going to lose is like four bucks with the handle. So, all right, it's eight thirty. <laughs> Before we lose anybody, questions, loans, drones, complaints. Um, yeah, so we've got one inch water line run all over, um, any chance you can, we've got one inch water line coming from the barn and then we spider web off of that. We've got two hydrants buried and, uh, I can show you, there we go. Okay. So. We come off of uh, the barn here, there's water at the barn. We've got a Richie energy free water here. And then we've got one inch buried to right here. And there's a hydrant here and then one inch to here. And there's a hydrant, frost free hydrant here. And then everything else is run above ground. And then we've got Poisson um, couplers that we just attach. And then uh, there's actually a water line above ground to about here back to the hydrant we just got quick connects so we can quick you know couple up to the hydrant and then we've got uh, 55 gallon water tanks with the joe floats in them so as soon as they take a drink it starts filling again and um it you know works out really well for us well what we'll do is uh i like to leave this east hillside pretty open you know this in the summertime we'll run heifers in here but and we can just break off of it with poly wire but uh probably like the end of march we'll set some bales out here and bale graze the old cows the old cows are on the farm to the west right now we'll just we'll bale graze that east slope before we bought the farm the other guy just made hay made hay made hay never putting nutrients back on so that place will take all the nutrients we can get so that east slope works out really well to bale graze on before we start calving cows out Yes, sir. Yes. Two weeks ago was a real pain. Everything was freezing. The Miracos, the Richies, everything. Um, we carried, you know, just luckily dad's at home. And uh, so he'd go up in the middle of the day and pour hot water on the discs or whatever and get them going. I'd do it before I left for work, do it when I come home from work. Yeah, it was just, that was a bear. I, you know, the energy free one, I don't, we had 17 head on it or 19 head, I think. And I thought it'd stay open, but they just weren't coming up enough. And I think they were eating snow too, you know, I don't know. I got so frustrated that the Richie on that lot up there by the barn, I ran a extension cord out to it and then we put one of those sinking waters in it and then just, we tried to get this 
lid down as tight as we could. And that helped out some. The, the discs weren't as frozen the next morning, at least, you know. So I didn't have to worry about smashing one of them discs and breaking it. But it was that wasn't too much fun. Penn's hockey game on. We can catch the last two periods. So, thank you for your uh, time. Appreciate it.